I'm Indy Nidell, and this is The Great War on the Road. Now today, we're at the Stowe Maris Aerodrome in Essex in England, and that's how the locals pronounce it, Stowe Maris. And this is one of those locals, but he's not just a local. This is Rory Kirkby, and he worked with us in Berlin on The Great War last winter. And he did the research behind such modern classic hits as Rasputin and Defense Against Submarines. So Rory, it's really nice of you to take time to do this with us today. Pleasure. Now he, he is volunteering here at the aerodrome. So he's going to show us around and he's going to tell us how an, a World War I aerodrome actually functioned. Now can you say a few words about the aerodrome in general, this, this one? Right, sure. So the aerodrome was founded by the Royal Flying Corps in 1916 yeah. to protect the Thames Estuary from incoming Zeppelin and Gorta raids by the Germans. And uh, this was a strategic location primarily because of the local river, the River Crouch, which the Germans would use as a navigational aid up towards the Thames and then towards London. Okay. So this was a prime spot to intercept incoming uh, German aircraft. Did they manage to shoot down any Zeppelins or Gothas from here? That's the problem. Uh, in 1916, this was a time just before the incendiary bullet was invented. So Zeppelins, as you've talk talked about before, are incredibly difficult to shoot down. Uh, so often pilots were talking about intercepting Zeppelins, but being unable to cause any significant damage. The other problem is the motto of the 37 Squadron is wise without eyes. And that's primarily because a lot of the raids from Zeppelins took place primarily at night. Yeah. So uh, yet they could be flying right alongside a Zeppelin without actually knowing, without the light of the moon, uh, where the Zeppelin actually was. So locating them and even reaching their height, which was far superior to the earlier aircraft, was very difficult. And, and what did this, did, when did they close this aerodrome? They closed it after the they war? They closed it in 1919, yes. So they kept it going until the Treaty of Versailles was signed because they, it was the 1918 uh, was a ceasefire yeah. rather than an actual peace treaty. So I didn't know whether they would have to be used in action again. So they closed it in 1919. Right. And, then, and then what happened to the aerodrome after the war, until now? So the aerodrome was first requisitioned from Flambert's farm down the road and it was returned to them after the war. Most, most farms and farmers would completely knock down all the buildings and turn it into farmland. The farmer here uh, chose to keep the buildings, which is quite unusual and unique. And he used them to store his vehicles or grain or whatever. And that's the reason why these buildings still survive. So this is the most, as they say, most complete World War I aerodrome in, in Europe. In fact, it's probably the only complete World War I aerodrome in Europe. It's entirely unique and uh, you, will never, you won't find anything else like this here. And how did you, how did you now you're a charitable organization. That's right, right yes. And how did you guys, when did that start and how did you guys get it set up? So uh, this place was essentially a lot of uh, broken shells. All the buildings were gutted and there was nothing left. And we took over the aerodrome some years ago and we've been attempting to restore each building piece by piece, uh, hangar by hangar, until it's back into its 1919 glory. Wow, and, and so do you, do you get, is it, uh, is it public funding or is it private funding? Or how does it's it a mixture of both, yes. We rely on all sorts of funding. Uh, all the buildings are listed, so we get a lot of help from uh, British charities to help imp us improve and maintain the buildings and keep them from collapse. Uh, and also a lot from philanthropists, uh, local help from volunteers as well to help rebuild uh, and take part in the aerodrome life itself as and well. And it's been rebuilt as much as it, as much like 1919 as you can. Yes, uh, we're, and it's still getting there, and we're, I would say, about halfway there, and it's just that extra step now. Okay, well, let's go take a look. Okay, before uh, we go any further, I'd like to say it's very windy today, so if there's any sound issues, we apologize in advance. Now, this, this lovely building here, what's this? So this is our main headquarters building. As you can see, it's not been uh, refurbished yet, although it's structurally safe. Uh, this is where new pilots would have received their orders uh, when they arrived. Uh, they would have come across the road over here, which is now an embankment of the field next door. Okay. They would have come across the parade ground, which is all grass, and arrived right here. This is the heart of the entire site. This is where all the administration is done and all the paperwork is done for the entire aerodrome. Now, you said that a lot of the, the enlisted men would, would be camped out here on the parade ground? That's right. So most of the men serving here would have been airmen, not pilots. Yeah. And they didn't have the luxury of uh, brick and uh, mortar, so they had to camp out in tents over here. Uh, this is all the parade ground that you can see here. This was planned to be concreted over uh, in 1919 but by then the war ended and everybody had packed up and left. Okay and so these would be some of the barracks then for 
or yes, so the uh, other guys. That's right. <laughs> so the officers were lucky enough to have their individual rooms and their own chimneys in the winter, and uh, they would have had a connecting corridor in all three of these buildings here, that so they could link to one another and console each other in the night, perhaps uh, waiting for the next day and the next mission. What sort of a, what sort of luxury compared to? tents would, would this be? I mean, was this was it still fairly bare bones or was it pretty It luxurious? was very bare bones. It was very spartan. It served its purpose, really. But they would have had a fire, a desk maybe, and a fairly sta standard bed. So a good place to put your head down at night. Uh, bearing in mind that they put their lives in incredible danger just getting to the planes, they perhaps deserved it. Whereas the airmen had the comfortable security of staying on the ground. And now we have one building that's off to the side back there. Yes, that's right. So over there would have been the women. That was my aerodrome. guess, because I thought it was yes, off to the side. tucked so. away, away from the rest of the uh, airmen and uh, the officers. Uh, the women would have done all the menial jobs on the site, the cooking, the cleaning. Uh, they would have ridden motorcycles as well, which was incredibly forward thinking for the times you can imagine. Yeah. This is really an era when women were empowered. They were given jobs, particularly in British society, in factories or in the uh, women's uh, air force. Uh, so they would have felt very empowered at a time when women's suffrage was a key issue. Yeah, it became... This is acts like this during the First World War from women, uh, ordinary women, from many from the local area here, would have helped the cause of su women's suffrage and uh, the, the right to vote in the 1920s. Now, see, these are all being being fixed up still. What, what about that one right there over to the side? So over here is our NCO's uh, uh, barracks. This is where non-commissioned officers, so sergeants, bearing in mind that the Royal Air Force didn't exist just yet. So all of the uh, staff here had what you'd expect of uh, the army's ranks. They would have had sergeants, lieutenants, captains. So the sergeants would have been kept over there. Okay. Some of them would have been flying. Uh, most of them may have been actually uh, spotters and observers in the aircraft trying to spot Zeppelins and Gorta bombers as they took off. Now that's interesting you bring up a point because before the Royal Air Force exists you actually had two air services. You had the Flying Corps and the Naval that's Air right. Service. That's right, we had the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service yeah. and in the 1st of April 1918, April Fool's Day, biggest joke running, uh, they decided to merge the two uh, to become the Royal Air Force as we know it today and still exists. The oldest independent air force on earth. Okay. Now we have this monument behind us, so why don't we go and uh, see what that is? All right. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting that the the air service and the flying corps had two different doctrines of uh, strategic bombing stuff that we saw in our strategic That's right. bombing special. Yes, absolutely. So this is our memorial here that was erected, as you can see, in uh, 2010. Okay. And if we go this side, we can uh, see the names of all the men who uh, served and died here, unfortunately. Who died actually here? Oh, or around the area, yes. Many of them served here. Uh, ten names in total. Only two of them were actually killed in action. Uh, those are Second Lieutenant Young and Airman Second Class Taylor. Were many of the others, did they die in training? Or yes, the biggest killer of all was training because it was such an unknown, it was such an unknown profession at the time. It was brand new and people didn't really know how an aircraft worked, oh, yeah. let alone how to fly one. So uh, many were killed due to their lack of experience. And also many of the instructors were war-weary uh, pilots sent back from the Western Front who really weren't in the mood for teaching more young men to go and die. So they gave it a half-hearted approach to say the least. Wow. Second, getting back, Second Lieutenant Young and uh, Second Class Taylor were actually intercepting uh, a group of German Gorta bombers over the Thames. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the British destroyer stationed on the Thames just below uh, thought that they were an enemy aircraft and they were actually killed in a friendly fire incident. Wow. Uh, Young's body was never recovered. Taylor was, but he died later of his wounds. They were 19 years old and 17 years old, respectively. So how long does it take for these buildings to be redone, these ones that they're working on? So we plan on hopefully having all these refurbished within 10 years, but obviously funding is important and also having the techni technical trades as well available because these buildings are listed and they have to be perfect as they were. You can see over there at the moment our officers' mess is currently being New buildings come into sight. Okay, which is the officers' mess? So the one in the far corner, the very big building there, Yeah. Uh, that would have been the equivalent of a five-star hotel. It was very posh because obviously many of these men came from very posh, educated backgrounds. Okay. So they would have had the luxuries of a tennis court, pool tables, wow. gramophones, drinking cabinets, obviously, and it would have been very comfortable in there. Well, let's check out the airman's mess. Yep. I'll bet this is not like a five-star hotel. 
No, well, as you can tell, the airman's mess wasn't designed to be as comfortable as the officer's mess Wait. because airmen were of a lower class. Can we actually, before we go in there, can we actually take a look at the latrines? Is that cool? Yeah? Yeah, sure. So these are our original First World War latrines over here. I was hoping you'd say that. And as you may find quite amusing, as we have a picture of the Kaiser in there. And does the other one have Haig? Uh, no, n nobody felt actually that badly about Haig at that time. That came later. Okay. But the Kaiser they definitely had some uh, strong feelings about him. Oh. As you can tell by Great his placement. Too. Yeah. Also, we've added newspaper for toilet paper. Oh yeah, of course. Okay, so airman's mess. Yes. So this was rec recently refurbished by our volunteers here. Yeah. Uh, this would have been uh, mainly benches and tables, very practical, very spartan again, because the airmen didn't deserve, obviously, the high quality of the officers enjoyed. So uh, here in the uh, airman's mess, could it accommodate all of the airmen at once, or would somebody be asleep or somebody would be on a... Well, yes, yeah, so, um, there, there would be different shifts as to when they would eat, and they'd have different times, because obviously this is a, a site that was in operation 24 hours a day, so they all couldn't eat at once, obviously. And how many uh, airmen were there when the base was at full capacity? So at its height in 1919, there would have been around about 300 uh, different members of staff, uh, airmen, women, uh, pilots all included. And now this right here, which we'll back away from, What's this? So this is our biggest feature. This is our water tower. Uh, you can see from the brick at the top, it's newly refurbished. It had a tree growing out of it originally. Uh, but this is where rainwater would be collected. And because it's quite an isolated area, this is, it needed its own supply of water. Oh yeah, sure. So this would have been purely for, uh, you know, washing and uh, other amenities rather than anything to do with the planes. But what gauge was it? Oh, uh, right. <laughs> I had to ask. Yeah. He said somebody <laughs> once asked him that, and neither of us know. Don't make me whether, swear on camera. <laughs> neither yeah. of us knows what that means. If you look out to the, here's the, here's, here's, here's where they would take off and, you know, fly from. Now, this is an aerodrome. It's not an airfield meaning that there are no runways. So you could take off in any direction, which was important then because these planes were, you know, made out of chicken wire and plaster and wind was a big issue. So you could take out, take off whichever direction the wind was coming from, you yes. could still actually take off and fly on your missions. And that's really important. That's absolutely true. And you had to always take off into the wind itself. Yeah. So we have a few air socks around here giving the direction of the wind where it's coming from. Yeah, there's And one. it also has to be bear in mind that, bore in mind that uh, this is completely grass because these planes had no braking system. Their main brake was the wooden skid at the back, which would dig into the earth and slow the plane down. Right. So it was in, uh, incredibly dangerous even landing. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, now, we heard earlier today that somewhere out there underneath the grass is still the Stomari, uh, it says that in, written in, in big white letters, chalk letters, yeah? That's writing. That's right, yes. Uh, there was, uh, it was very difficult to navigate in those days, obviously. So Stomari's was written uh, in big chalk letters a bit like the Hollywood sign out there. Uh, and also there was a white outline of a Gorta bomber. And that was uh, for training purposes. They would try to attack and strafe the Gorta bomber oh, for to try target. and perfect their machine gunning. And those you can still see, he said you can see them if you fly over with heat imaging equipment. That's but right, they're, yes. under the, uh, they're under the ground today. Yes. I think it's really fascinating that. Okay, so the fuel store. Yes, so you may have noticed that there's no roof on this. Right. And that's for a very important reason. Any event of an explosion, you want the explosion to be able to travel straight upwards. So if you have a roof on, it's going to, just going to cause more damage to the surrounding uh, buildings. Okay. Uh, the only problem with this, though, is it left it quite exposed to the elements. Sure. And you can imagine in a time when everybody smoked and had cigarettes and that, it was quite a health hazard and wouldn't really live up to today's health and safety regulations. Okay. Well, let's move along, shall we? Okay, now this is them setting up for tomorrow and everything. Yes, right? that's right. Okay, but the building is still uh, yeah, Royal Engineers. The, the building that was recently refurbished, you can see the new windows, brand new roof, that was English heritage. Okay. And uh, the Royal Engineers played a crucial role here. As most of the aeroplanes had to be maintained, uh, kept uh, in working order. So the pilots would really put their lives in the hands of the raw engineers who worked here 24 hours a day, seven days yeah. a week. So incredibly important job there. I guess the planes were gone over every single day, basically. 
Right. Yes, yes, and bearing in mind how flimsy and fragile these planes were, they need a constant care and attention oh, yeah. to keep them in the sky. I mean, just one tear in the canvas and that could That's be... That's it, yeah, it needs a whole new canvas or even a splintered piece of wood that needs new, new pieces uh, of timber to restructure it again. And the blacksmith in the car? Yeah, so the car, we would have had quite a few vehicles here, uh, as we'll see more of the uh, motor transport shed up here. Uh, and uh, the blacksmith, uh, you can probably uh, guess, wasn't actually used for horses. Uh, it would have been used for air aircraft parts, mending the machines that the raw engineers would use on the aircraft themselves. Um, you can also notice that the outer wall of the blacksmith is brand new. And that's because after the end of the First World War, nobody had thought to tell the Germans that this airfield was no longer in use. Uh, so in 1940, uh, the Luftwaffe actually bombed this area uh, quite severely, uh, but only the blacksmith outer wall was damaged, so they weren't particularly accurate. So they just said, oh, we've got maps there, oh, this, is, this, is, where, this yes. is where those lines yeah, are. Yeah, they saw an airfield and no aircraft, but assumed that they were <laughs> hidden somewhere. Well, you lost a wall. Yes. Curse you. <laughs> and the ambulance, which is not an ambulance, you say? No, this is perhaps a more morbid part of the tour. Okay, ladies and gentlemen who are fans of morbidity, here we go. Yes, you maybe noticed that there are actually vents at the top of this building. And that's because it was primarily used as a mortuary. Right. Uh, we had quite a few flying accidents here, as we saw at the memorial earlier. This is where the pilots would have been uh, brought first to keep their bodies uh, stored before they were buried nearby at the uh, churchyard in Stone Maris. An ambulance sounds nicer than mortuary. Yeah, it's uh, particularly nicer for visitors who are not oh, yeah. confronted by death con uh, instantaneously. Okay. Now this has an interesting name, the Dope Workshop. Yeah, there is no drug smuggling operation going on here, I promise. Well, if there was, they probably wouldn't advertise it. No, that's quite true. Uh, but you're right, this is where uh, the canvas uh, was put on the uh, wings of the plane. Because right. the, the plane was so flimsy, it was made of basically wood canvas, and the only metal we'd really find would be around the fuselage and the engine. That's it, no protection for the pilot whatsoever. But this is where the canvas was shrunk on to the wooden frame of the plane, and they did that with a chemical substance called dope. Uh, but this was a very highly toxic chemical and was uh, a hallucinogenic also. And people who worked in there often complained of collapsing and passing out because of it. It was so thick and heavy, there's actually a vent at the back of the building where the chemical substance would sink to the floor and roll out of the uh, gutters So the, the vent's on, at the bottom, not at, at the, the bottom, top? At the bottom, that's right, yeah. The okay. chimney at the top is utterly useless. And is that where dope and common usage comes from? Yes, yes, that's okay. right. And uh, all here is our engine workshop, which is now our main museum that you uh, enter when you arrive. Okay. And uh, we also have another one of our vehicles here. We uh, affectionately named Beryl. Beryl. That's right, after one of our uh, trustees at the uh, museum. Okay. And if you look over here to your right, you'll be able to see the motor transport sheds. Uh huh. okay, cool. And this is where we would have kept all our vehicles, obviously, Okay. Uh, given the name. But uh, also there we have uh, many photographs uh, from the time uh, suggesting that here we also used to hold tea parties for the locals and we would also try to drum up revenue for war bonds, a war bond drive to buy more planes to uh, keep in the air on the Western Front. And how, how did they get along with the locals? Was there a lot of contact or was it just things there like There was an this? incredible amount of contact. The local pub was frequently used by uh, the pilots and the airmen. Uh, a lot of the women who worked here were sourced locally as well. And uh, the sports days here that they held to uh, raise money for the war effort were incredibly popular with the local populace also. Well, Roy, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, show us all that. Absolute pleasure. And uh, well, I thought that was really fascinating and I'm sure you guys learned a bunch. And if you want to learn even more, you should definitely come to Stomari's Aerodrome. Um, it's only, what, 45, 50 minutes from London? Perhaps less than that. And it's close to Stansted Airport anyway. Absolutely. So you, can, you can fly in and there's all those cheap flights all from all over Europe to Stansted. So we'll see all of you here Next time we're here, which Flo will tell you about, won't you, Flo? Yes. Okay, we'll be back again. And if you'd like to see our episode about Bloody April, which was very much airplane related, you can click right here in front of Rory for that. See you soon.